Welcome to the stage, Mr. Paul Shirley, to share his hero's journey. This is Paul's theme song, by the way. This is, we're, not, we're not playing crazy transitional music. This is something that he, he likes to enter the room, apparently, to this song. Does anybody, anybody know who this is? Well, the musician knows, but anybody else? You, yeah, thank you. It's Def Leppard. What I'm most proud of is on my... Wait for the eyes and the hose. That's real good right there. Nice work, Justin. What I'm most proud of is that uh, on my sticker here, I got the, the E's written correctly like this, which is what Joey Eck did in seventh grade. I had a total crush on Joey Eck, so I'm happy about that. Um, did anybody else's, so when you guys were doing this thing, did anybody else's arms get really tired? <laughs> okay, thank you, because I used to be a professional athlete and I still was like, this is too much. I mean, it was amazing. It was great. I don't mean to deride it anyway. I just saying I was getting really tired and I thought I need to get, go back to the gym badly. Um, so, so let's see here. I got to do some technical things. We had, a, we had the, the little slideshow majigger here. So let's bear with me as I get, get that stuff together. Um, by the way, I'm gonna have to, I'll be fast because there was a guy, as I was standing back there, there was a guy who was walking past and it was like right in the middle of the Kundalini stuff and I saw him look and then I think he went to call the FBI because I'm pretty sure he was like, that's the next David Koresh situation in there. So I'll try to be speedy so that we get out of here before the FBI gets here. Um, okay, does anybody know who that is? One guy, just one guy knows. 22 people know. All right, so you 22 people, by the time I get back around to him in the story, which is about six minutes from now, I want you to have explained it to everyone around you, okay? That's your job. Uh, so as Light mentioned, I played professional basketball. Sorry, I keep stepping over. This is not gonna be acceptable. We're gonna have to move it. Um, also, like, I'm going to be moving around more than I let on. We had a whole thing where, like, just stay in here, but I'm going to, it's going to be all over the place, so get ready for that. Um, so I played professional basketball, but it didn't work the way that people on the street think that it did. People on the street will be like, hey, man, you're really tall. Did you ever think about playing professional basketball? <laughs> it didn't go that way. I was, I was the kid. I'm from a tiny town in Kansas, and I used to on my parents' driveway, which was made of gravel, even. The basket was up on the deck. I would sit outside, just shooting baskets as a 13-year-old, happy as I could be. I found something peaceful in the fact that wherever I was in the world, in, in my mind, there was something okay about just making baskets. So I, little stereotype that I was, little white kid Hoosiers wannabe, went off to Iowa State University to play basketball. And that had some, some ups, not including my haircut right there. That's not, <laughs> that was not an up. But it also had some downs. This was, by the way, I won't, I won't tell you this whole story because it would be too long, but this was on the front page of the campus newspaper right after we had lost in the Elite Eight on Monday. And I had like gotten over it and then I went and I was like, oh, Jesus. Incidentally, a girl in the library that day had the nerve to ask me to autograph this. <laughs> I did not ask for her phone number because of the haircut that you saw before. <laughs> so anyway, played basketball in college at this fairly big college, and by the end it became clear that like, I had a chance to be a professional, like I could probably do this for money. And, uh, and so I set off on what proved to be a rather long and hard road to the NBA. As the little whippersnapper, the 13-year-old, I'd always dreamed, like any 13-year-old in Kansas, about making it to the NBA. That was the ultimate goal. So I went off to training camp with the Los Angeles Lakers my first year out of school, and 
There I learned that Shaquille O'Neal is among the most interesting and pleasant humans I've ever met, and that Kobe Bryant is the exact opposite of that. <laughs> the Lakers cut me as quickly as they could, and then I went off to Greece, where I learned that the Greek people are very friendly, their food is amazing, but they're terrible with money. Just awful. Like, they paid me almost exactly half what they owed me, which was frustrating. I came home that summer back to my parents' house to sleep and get ready for the next year, and then I went to training camp with the Atlanta Hawks. And this year, I made it a little bit further. I made it to the night before opening day, and then they cut me. And then I went off to Yakima, Washington to play in the CBA for the Yakima Sun Kings. I lived in a... Yeah, the Sun Kings. It's a real thing. I lived in a motel, so that's the kind of hotel where your door opens to the outside, which was especially interesting because you would go into your little rabbit hole and like all of the team stayed on the same floor, right? So once you went in, everybody knew that you were inside. So if they wanted to come get you to like go get some food or whatever, they would like, well, Paul's obviously in his room. I saw him go into his room so I can go knock on his door, right? What's tough about that is like getting up to no good in your room like maybe romantically or something. Like everybody knows you're in your room, so they're pounding on your door, and you're like, ugh, leave me alone, please. Especially because there's nobody else in here because I'm in the goddamn CBA. No <laughs> girls want to talk to me. <laughs> so, after three months in the CBA, the Atlanta Hawks call. The Atlanta Hawks are an NBA team. They want to sign me to a 10-day contract, and so I go to Atlanta to play for 10 days. I play five minutes and don't score. And this is not, this was not the goal. The goal was not like, just have a uniform with your name on the back and play never. The goal was to be an NBA basketball player and stick around in the NBA. So after the Hawks sent me away, I went to Spain to play professional basketball for four months. And that was fine. And then the next year, I'll, I'll speed through the next part. I went to training camp with the New Orleans Hornets. Then they cut me. I went to play for an exhibition team that played college teams. And if you look very closely, if you get very close to me, I have a scar here and a scar here where this guy hit me with one elbow on the way through and then the other elbow on the way as he followed it. Then I went to play for a, a team in the ABA called the Kansas City Knights. We played games in such glorious locales as Tijuana, Mexico and Juarez, Mexico. And then finally, the Chicago Bulls called. The Bulls were terrible at the time. This is not the fun Bulls, this is the bad Bulls. But still, it was the Chicago Bulls. I grew up in Kansas. The Bulls are the deal, right? You're from Kansas, the Bulls are a big deal. So I go off to the Bulls and I make the team. And pretty soon, I'm this guy. I'm playing for the freaking Chicago Bulls. Thanks. <laughs> It was a long time ago, guys, so I, my, we could take that applause and re apply it retroactively. That'd be great. Um, so I'm playing for the Bulls, and I, my first goal is that I'm going to score, right? Which I do on this very pleasant 19-foot jump shot in the middle of the United Center. And then the next goal is to work my way into the lineup. I want to be a mainstay in the NBA, and this is my chance. This all kind of culminates in a game at the Indiana Pacers. We're playing in Indianapolis. And mostly to prove a point to a couple of guys that were very young and very entitled, the coach put me in the game for a long time. And then coming out of a timeout, I heard, hey, you know, Shirley's doing a pretty good job on, on Ron Artest. <laughs> we ought to leave him in there for a while. And that's what they did. I played 19 minutes in the second half. And if you're not a basketball person, I don't expect you to know exactly what that means. But Usually NBA players for, play for eight or nine minutes and then come out and then go back in later. I had been in for 19 straight minutes and I'd been in this, whatever, ABA, I can't even remember which minor league it had been. I wasn't used to playing at this level, but I knew that this was that moment. You have a moment in many things, in music, in writing, in professional basketball, where if I can just do this right, then things are gonna change. And I knew I could just kind of tell this was my moment. With about five minutes to go in this game, we're going to pretend now that Ron Artest's head is the basket. So with about five minutes to go, I can tell that there's a play developing over there and that I need to go help on this play. Because again, I'm on a 10-day contract again. I've got to do everything right or they're going to send me back to the ABA. So 
the play develops, I rotate over, and I'm going to take a charge, right? So a charge is what you see when there's a defender standing there and the offensive player runs into him and he falls down. I was very good at it. I knew how to please coaches. I was excellent at that. Um, so I get there, and this player named Austin Crozier goes up for this layup, and I get there kind of late, and as he puts his knee into my side, my left kidney and spleen hit my backbone and explode like a watermelon that's been thrown off the top of this building. But I don't know that. I know that I'm on a 10-day contract, and I can't make a big deal out of this. If my dad taught me anything, it was that nobody cares about the guy who's hurt, especially if he's on a 10-day contract. So I roll off to the edge. I'm like, okay, just hold it together. You probably just bruised a rib. It's not gonna, we're going to get through this, Paul. You've been through some shit before. We're going to get through this. The trainer comes over, takes care of me. They take me back, and the game ends, and I get x-rayed. There's no, there's no broken rib, which is alarming because I'm thinking at least if there's a broken rib, I could blame it on something, right? As far as I know, I'm just being a sissy because this is starting to hurt. What's happening is that my retroperitoneal cavity, which is back here, is filling up with blood. But again, I don't know that. So they put me on a, they put all of us on our fancy chartered plane to fly back to Chicago. And when I get on the plane, the trainer, whose name is Fred, has built this little bed area for me. I lie down in that little kind of bed zone and he says, all right, I'm gonna go back to the back with the rest of the team and the media and all of that. Just, you know, come find me if you need help. So I lay down, and again, I'm thinking, okay, Paul, all you got to do is get through the next hour and get back to the residence inn, which is where you're living, very glamorously, <laughs> and you can figure this out. I've been through things like this before. You can, you can do this. You also get a multiple personality disorder when you play in the NBA. <laughs> um, so I'm laying there, and uh, as we, we go down the runway, the jostling is starting to make the blood kind of come out a little more aggressively, and then we take off, and the pressure change makes it come out a little more aggressively, right? So I'm not feeling great. I'm like, uh-oh, this isn't bad, especially if this is just a bruised rib. Like, I thought I was going to play in professional basketball, and I can't even take a bruised rib. So at that moment, I turned to... Wait. Oh, we went backwards. Not to run our test. I turned to Scotty Pippen. Scotty Pippen played with, most famously, the guy who wore number 45 right before I did for the Chicago Bulls. That's a, that's a great bit of trivia that you'll never be able to use because it's too trivial. Like, who wore number 45 for the Chicago Bulls after Michael Jordan? So I turn to Scottie Pippen and I say, Scotty, go get Fred. Which is not how my interaction with Scotty Pippen was supposed to go, right? Scotty Pippen had gone away from the Bulls, played for the Houston Rockets and the Portland Trailblazers, and had now come back to retire as a Bull. And so he was on the team, and what I had imagined when I found out Scotty Pippen's back on the team, like, imagine, like, Pippen to Shirley for two. Like, that would be, that would mean I'd made it, right? Like, that goal that we talked about, the kid in the driveway, that would be it. I have made it if Scotty Pippen is passing the ball and I'm scoring. Not, Scotty, please go get Fred. <laughs> so, so Scotty Pippen goes back and gets Fred, and, and they get me through the next hour. The next hour is filled with me screaming and shrieking and hyperventilating such that my fingers and my toes are numb. I can see the panicked look in Fred's eyes. He had been a trainer for the San Francisco 49ers and later told me that he was afraid I was going to die on the plane because he thought, like, what if, like, there's no way to know how much bleeding is going on. What I kept saying was, A, what's wrong with me? He didn't want to scare me, so he's just like, we don't know. <laughs> and B, when am I going to pass out? We don't know. And C, can't you give me something for this? And he's like, no. So I just curled into a ball and shrieked. And while I was shrieking, I remember thinking, I'm never going to live this down with all of these professional basketball players, media members, all sorts of important people who are in the back, like, who the hell is this kid from Kansas who's been here for six days, and now he's up there caterwauling like a bear cat that's got his paw trapped in a cage trap, whatever. I don't know. It's, yeah, it was a ridiculous analogy. I made that one up right here. That did not write that one. That one did not. That one came off badly. It hurts, is what I'm saying. Have some sympathy, guys. It hurt a lot. So... 
They radio ahead and clear all of the traffic out of O'Hare Airport. Let us land first. They bring an ambulance onto the tarmac. They get me onto a stretcher. They get me to the hospital, and they finally start me on Dilaudid. Has anyone ever been on Dilaudid? Oh, geez, I did not expect that many pain pill addicts. Uh, Dilaudid is like, like morphine is here, Dilaudid's like here. So I was starting to feel better, but I still felt terrible. And I remember vividly, I'm laying on the operating table or whatever, and the guy's like, hey, buddy, so if you can't turn over, we're going to have to cut off your shirt. And I'm thinking, like, this is ridiculous. Like, yeah, you're going to have to cut off my shirt, because I can't move. I just can't move at this point. So they cut off my shirt. They, they send me down for a CT scan. They realize that the renal artery has not been cut, which is what they're most worried about. And that basically, I'm just, I've just got a big pool of blood in here which is bad because that's not where it's supposed to be there's any blood, right? Like that's not the normal spot for blood. <laughs> so they put me in the ICU and I'm there for nine days or so. I become intimately acquainted with a Foley catheter. <laughs> this is not my penis, guys. <laughs> that is that's taken from the internet. That's not a human's penis. I didn't wanna, I knew it would be a clean crowd so I didn't wanna do anything porny. That's, that's how they train you to put in a Foley catheter. What it feels like they're doing is taking those like burrs and putting them into your urethra, which is not fun. So eventually, I get out of the hospital and eventually I'm able to walk again. And eventually, this blood in my body starts to just be resorbed, which is kind of creepy when you think about it. Like, it's just like a giant scab. It's like a liter of blood that your body just takes in somehow, which is wild. So playing for the Bulls didn't go great, is the moral of that story. So I was not able to worm my way into the NBA via the Chicago Bulls. I did manage, though, to get recovered in time to go to training camp that next year with the Phoenix Suns. I actually I made the opening day roster of the Phoenix Suns, which was quite, a, quite an achievement considering I'd had this in my dick like <laughs> three months before. And then two days into the season, the Suns, who did not care about this progress, cut me. And I went to play in Russia. And I thought Russia would be kind of cool because Russian girls are pretty. But Russia was not cool because no one in Russia smiles ever. <laughs> and because I think psychologically, I was just blasted by the previous three years. And so after two months there, I turned down $275,000 to stick it out for five more months and went home, but like home, home to my parents' house to open the Christmas presents that I'd missed and to think about what I was gonna do next because I couldn't imagine continuing to play basketball. I was 27 years old and I'd had enough. Why was that funny? That's weird. <laughs> In his darkest hour, that's when he was the most hilarious. So I'm at my parents' house and my basketball agent calls and I assume he's just calling to make sure I've made it home from Siberia. And uh, so I pick up the phone and he says, are you sitting down? And I said, no. And he said, you should. And that's why I learned that you should sit down when somebody says that. He said, I just got a contract for you with the Phoenix Suns for the rest of the year. And this, I mentioned that I'd been on these 10-day contracts and, and everything about my life had been very unstable to this point. So the fact that I was gonna be on a team until the end of the year meant this might be it. I might be about to make it. Incidentally, this is the Phoenix Suns of, of Steve Nash, who I'm sure is someone in here's favorite player. Her, actually, yes. A lot of white people, a lot of people gonna love Steve Nash. So. This Phoenix Suns team eventually goes to the Western Conference Finals is 62 and 20 at the end of the year, the best team in the NBA, and I'm on it. Unfortunately, I didn't do a lot of playing. I did a lot of that. <laughs> Slightly better haircut, but still a little regrettable. I feel like I was in a gel phase, maybe. <laughs> Don't love it. But anyway, did a lot of clapping, and, uh, and while the clapping was happening, the team said, hey, do you, uh, would you write for our website? Because you seem vaguely coherent, and it's 2005, and blogs are a thing now, and it'd be interesting to have your perspective on things. They didn't know that I'd been writing 
throughout my career and had planned to write a book when I was done. And so the writing was okay. And it was okay enough that it resulted in a book deal from Random House. They called and said, hey, do you want to write a book about your basketball career? And I'm like, now? And they're like, yep. And I said, well, yes, you don't say no to Random House. So I wrote a book about my career to that point. I was, again, 27 years old, so what did I know? But again, Random House says, write a book, you write a book. And I thought at the time, well, okay, so playing with the Chicago Bulls didn't quite work. Being a bench warmer with the Phoenix Suns didn't quite work. But now I'm that guy who can write. Everybody likes on your bench, like a clean cut white dude who can also write. That's got to help marketing, <laughs> right? <laughs> Wrong. My agent told me, you just made yourself persona non grata in the NBA because they do not want their secrets told, especially by you. So the NBA is now out. I've strike two on making it. So I go off to Spain and I play in Spain. And in a lot of ways, Spain was sort of perfect for me. I met this beautiful half Dutch, half Spanish girl. And I I've kind of found my level. Like Spain's the second best basketball world, uh, basketball league in the world. And I'm just about right for the second best basketball league in the world. <laughs> and had some great experiences, had some less than great ones. I had a couple of knee surgeries while I was there and, and then broke an ankle, had three surgeries on my ankle. And this concludes Paul's discussion of all of his maladies. Um, and then pretty soon, I was 33 years old, and basketball was over. That was it. I wasn't going to make it to the NBA. That, was, that ship had long since sailed. And my body was kind of falling apart, so it was clear that I was done. That, by the way, is kind of a mind fuck to be 33 years old and decrepit. And I could probably come back in 18 months and give the discussion, give you the talk about what that's like. But that's not what today's is about. I thought, what am I going to do now? I've written this book, right? So what if I write another book? Brilliant. I, I think I'll write something based on these experiences I've had in Spain. Kind of a novel, kind of a memoir. I don't know exactly where it'll go. So I spent three years writing this book. And after three years, I was done, and I sent it off to my big-time literary agent in New York. And then I went to New York to see what he thought, and he said, actually, Paul, this is pretty good. People, people tend to say that when you're an athlete. Like, surprisingly, you're not an idiot. So he sent it out to 12 publishers, and all 12 of those publishers said no. And I, again, determined little Kansan that I am, said, well, I'll publish this myself. So I sent it off to a friend of mine and had her edit it, and patiently awaited her email. And then it came to a coffee shop not far from here, because by then I had moved to Los Angeles. And in this email, she said, sorry, Paul, but this is really neither a memoir nor a novel and it's just not good enough. I burst into tears in this coffee shop because this was my only real plan. I thought like, the first book went okay, I'll just write another one and then that will be the ticket to the next 50 years of my life. So then I had what will be familiar to screenwriters here. Any screenwriters? One, two, three, four. More people hooked on Dilaudid than screenwriters <laughs> in LA. That's says something about this crowd. <laughs> well, anyway, in screenwriting, they talk about the dark night of the soul. That's when the, the protagonist goes out and in the stereotype sits in the cemetery and wonders, like, what am I going to do next? And I didn't go to a cemetery, but there was probably some booze involved, and there were, it took a long time to figure out what was going on. And what I realized through all of this was that when I started playing basketball, when I just was in my backyard shooting, I did it because I loved it. I did it because it felt good. It did, I did it because I was only worried about what that moment was bringing. But then I changed it and I kind of perverted it. I, want, I changed basketball into this ticket to validation. It meant that my father was gonna care about me, that the people in my small town would like me, that pretty girls would love me. And so I realized then I was doing the same thing with writing. Like I wasn't really writing what I cared about. I was writing what I thought might sell and make me famous someday. And all of that brings us to now. Now is a little bit difficult to reconcile sometimes. I live in a sort of shitty apartment in a sort of shitty part of town. 
I made like $25,000 last year. I qualified for Medi-Cal for about half of 2015. I teach some, I run a couple of writing workshops. I write for a Spanish newspaper about the NBA. I teach English at a prep school for the police academy, which is very strange as well. <laughs> I'm a really long way from those Four Seasons hotels that I got to stay in for whatever, 30 nights or however long I was in the NBA. But I'm also writing a lot. I have, I have three different books in the works. I have one that's first draft is done, one whose second draft is done, one whose fourth draft is done. But what's important about those books is not the number of them or the drafts that they're on. What's important is that each day I write a certain amount and each day I'm present just like I used to be on the gravel driveway. Maybe books come out of all of this and maybe they get published and maybe they don't. I can't, I can't really say that I don't care about that because I'm just as neurotic as everybody else in this crowd that we tried to heal earlier. Although, we, apparently we learned they're not neurotic, right? They're enlightened. Yeah. So, if you're unenlightened like I am, then sometimes these moments of like, I just want to get famous, I just want to get published, these moments will come in. I will say, though, that when I find myself thinking about this, I think back to this dude. And I think back to saying, Scotty, go get Fred. The problem with all of this is that it doesn't really have a Hollywood ending in that I don't have a bestseller I can tell you about. But I think that maybe that's better because if you think about it, that guy right there probably played with 3,000, 4,000 other basketball players and most of them he's forgotten. But I'm gonna guess that he's not gonna forget the guy on the 10-day contract who asked him, the future Hall of Famer, for a little bit of help. The help that eventually led me to understand a lot more about presence and the moment and how life works. Thanks for listening to me today.